I did an internship with Dr. Corey Mominy at his pharmaceutical and biomedical lab, where I worked on producing large quantities of non-coding RNAs. This is where I acquired most of my knowledge on the following. There are multiple types of non-coding RNAs, such as miRNAs, LNC RNAs, snRNAs, tRNAs, and rRNAs. Each of these have a different function inside a cell. To be able to understand these different functions, one must create a plentiful amount of RNAs and visualize an RNA structure. We will focus on the non-coding RNAs at the transcriptional level. So what are non-coding RNAs? Non-coding RNAs are small or large RNA molecules that do not create proteins, but are involved in transcription. Transcription is the process of copying DNA into messenger RNA, which is then used to create proteins through a process called translation. Let me show you what transcription looks like. As you see here, we have DNA. Now, an RNA polymerase molecule comes and attaches itself to a gene and tears the DNA strand apart. Then, it starts moving down the single DNA strand, creating mRNA. Okay, so let's talk about where the non-coding RNA comes into play. So, if you look at the strip of messenger RNA, you see what is called an intron right in the middle. This intron does not do anything. It is so insignificant that the messenger RNA wants it removed. So these large molecules, called spliceosomes, come cut the intron on each side and remove it. These spliceosomes are composed of small non-coding RNAs called snRNAs. Another non-coding RNA, called miRNA, binds to a specific target on the messenger RNA. This RNA does not always bind to messenger RNA, but if it does, it silences a gene, which prevents the gene from being expressed and prevents the messenger RNA from translating into a protein. What is important to take from all this is that non-coding RNAs originate in transcription. The easiest way to produce non-coding RNA is to create a plasmid. A plasmid is a circular strand of bacterial DNA that is independent from the chromosomal DNA of a bacterium. Most of the time, E. coli is the bacterium. Here, you have a plasmid. This plasmid can be cut open using what are called restriction enzymes. Then, you can insert whichever DNA gene you choose. The plasmid is then closed up with another enzyme called ligase. From here, you can stick the plasmid into an E. coli cell. As you can see, E. coli has its own chromosomal DNA, which is separate from the plasmid that has been inserted into it. Now, you can grow E. coli colonies, which have millions of E. coli cells inside of them. Some E. coli colonies will contain the correct plasmid inside, while others have the incorrect plasmid. You must make sure to choose the E. coli colony with the correct plasmid. This can be done based on specific phenotypic characteristics such as colony color or ability to grow in the presence of an antibiotic. After choosing the correct colony, you can make high quantities of it. Our next step is to extract the non-coding RNA, which is already present in the E. coli cells due to them undergoing transcription during growth. 
Once pure non-coding RNA is obtained through extraction, we can then visualize it. There are two different ways nucleic acid structures are visualized, through secondary structures and tertiary structures. In creating tertiary structures, it is necessary to use secondary structures as a reference. A secondary structure represents a structure inside a molecule characterized by the folding of nucleotides, which can be modified. Secondary structures are restricted to the second dimension. This means, although they may not display all of the realistic forms that strands of genetic material may take, they may be simpler to understand as they clearly display the sequences of genes. A tertiary structure has a three-dimensional shape. This means it is able to accurately display the realistic twists, loops, and folds within the strands of material, which in our case is non-coding RNA. After determining the secondary structure through analyzing gene sequences, we can now begin determining the tertiary structure through X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography uses X-ray beams to determine the molecular structure of an RNA molecule. The way this works is your non-coding RNA molecules are formed into crystals, which constitute molecules that are tightly packed and aligned uniformly. From there, you project an X-ray beam through the crystal which disperses the beam into what looks like little spots when captured on a solid surface. The location of these refraction patterns are dependent on the internal structure of the crystal. Now, you must determine what RNA structure would result in the specific positions and intensities of the little spots. This is similar to how a lens works which takes scattered light rays and finds the focal point, the point where the rays are first dispersed. Through our understanding of light's behavior and mathematics, we then solve for the three-dimensional structure of the molecule which causes the deflections. This process could take hours or days, depending on the complexity of the molecule. The importance of studying non-coding RNA molecules resides in the fact that they can provide new insights into evolution, biology, and medicine. For example, non-coding RNAs can affect gene expression, which can play a role in disease development. An understanding of the structures and functions of non-coding RNAs can lead to developments in medical treatments. This could possibly be done through eliminating the harmful effects that non-coding RNAs may have on gene expressions, as well as harnessing non-coding RNAs gene blocking capabilities and directing them towards potentially harmful genes. Many researchers believe the study of non-coding RNA may lead to the next big thing in science and medicine. Although our understanding of it is only the tip of the iceberg, as the science community directed attention towards it fairly recently, the study of non-coding RNA seems to present vast opportunity.